Today we'll be taking a slight turn on the podcast. We'll be moving away from the psychological, psi, and scientific explorations of consciousness and for the very first time, move into the spiritual. It's a natural progression in our opinion because we can't fully explore the mystery of consciousness without including the religious or philosophical impulses that all humans share in one sense or another. It's indeed a part of our nature to explore such things as the super or preternatural, and this podcast is dedicated to include all voices. My guest today comes from a tradition which has captured the imagination of Western European thought since it was first introduced in North America in the 60s by a writer named Carlos Castaneda, but the tradition itself is very old indeed. Don Jose Ruiz is a writer and a teacher in the Toltec tradition, a Mesoamerican shamanic practice. Like Castaneda, his father, Don Miguel Sr., became quite popular in North America and Europe with a book entitled The Four Agreements. Don Jose and his brother Miguel continue in their father's footsteps, and I'm very pleased that they'll be joining us in the discussion today. Don Jose is with us. Thank you very much for being here, and welcome to the conversation, my friend. Oh, thank you, Mark. Very happy to be here with you this morning. The pleasure is ours. So I know very little about the Toltec tradition. I'm very excited to speak to you both today um, about the work that you're doing in keeping the tradition alive. My background and understanding and knowledge of shamanism in the Americas is mostly rooted in North American shamanic practices and the beliefs of the natives here. Uh, so give us a little bit of a background as to what the Toltec tradition is and how it might differ from the shamanic practices of the North American natives. Well, the Toltecs are a tribe from uh, ancient Mexico. Mm-hmm. And the word Toltec in Nahuatl means artist. Yes. And the only difference after, you know, I only know from 1978, from this point on, <laughs> and then I see many stories, but I have the opportunity in my life to travel around the world Mm -hmm. to meet different practitioners in the shamanic tradition. The only difference I found is that they just name it differently. It's just a different name. Just like if we speak Spanish, English, Japanese, it's just the the ceremonies and how they hold that belief. But when we in the Totec tradition uh, go into Nahualism, which is the translation for shamanic Mm -hmm. or Swamihood or any other mystical connection to the infinite, and this is where it comes from. The Totec are open source with awareness that they know the infinite comes through them. And in the modern medicine, in the shamanic tradition, it's about healing, healing with spirit, and spirit puts into every word. Mm-hmm. So in the shamanic tradition, I see it in the whole world like if it's a hospital. Yeah. In a hospital, you have different doctors or different type of doctors, some for the mind, some from the heart, some from the liver. So you, we have all these different practitioners. So in this point on, I really feel in my heart that all of these practitioners are here to serve as, as an extension of the planet, which is Divine Mother Earth, mm-hmm. which is an open channel to get all these tools, how we dream in life and co-merge all of them together. So in the big picture, I see it the same in all traditions because we are a service. So service to the community, service to the planet, service to the creator, service to all of life in general. Yeah, to all life. I see. Let's talk about Carlos Castaneda. What do you know of his work? Have you read his writings? And what are your thoughts about it? Does he represent the tradition well? Well, yes, because he did it in the perfect time. Mm -hmm. He followed his heart. Mm -hmm. And he was in the time of the 60s Mm -hmm. where... People were open to this new idea, this new concept. People were looking for some alternative right. to look for the journey. And Castaneda was a brilliant mind that got prepared as an anthropologist in San Francisco that went to go do um, a lot of uh, research and met a different traditions. So he knew how to master the words right. and translate the ancestors' messages and medicine into a modern culture, which was very needed. Mm -hmm. And he found a very interesting source of storytelling to communicate what the minds in that time were ready to hear. And at the same time, we're so grateful for this accomplishment because it was the beginning of the Totec tradition coming back to life. And before Carlos Castaneda though, there was an old saying in the old town in Totihuacan that there was a magic 
person from the East that wore orange robes. And later we find out that this Swami was named Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda. Mm -hmm. And he said when he went to Totihuacan, he was dealing with his own challenges. Because in America, they started putting bad name, his best friend, you know, get mixed up with women and get all these problems. So they were putting it on him. So he was feeling his test. Uh, he was feeling his faith getting tested. So he just wanted to go to the Himalayas, forget about everything. But his teacher said, you still have work to do. Mm -hmm. So to finish his apprenticeship with his teacher, his teacher went to Samadhi. He came back to the Americas, went back to Mexico before he went to the Americas again. And he said um, that there was a sleeping giant in Teotihuacan. Mm -hmm. That it was all his energy to make this giant grow. And after that, uh, he went into Samadhi, he passed away, but new life began happening in Mexico, which 10 years later, um, Castaneda's other anthropologists begin now cultivating the area. The, 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 the Jackies were ready to expose the, the, the truth, just like in India, just like in Africa, the truth was now ready to be put in. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the most beautiful things that I see how intent works and how it is Divine Mother putting everything in the whole history, putting it together. And this is when, you know, after the Castaneda, uh, I was following the fire within. And the fire within is to protect us from ourselves, to see how our mind dreams, mm -hmm. because the words are not the real thing. And many people in this world think that the world is the real thing. The words are the real thing, but they're not. They are a tool to communicate from the infinite what we feel from the within. So in this point on, we find a lot of challenges to unlearn. And this is exactly what the Toltec are ready to do. So everything became changing, even in the tradition of Don Carlos, that was okay in the 60s. But now we are like half a century later. Right. So the development of man, of dreaming, of humanity has evolved even more. So at the Totec, when we talk about the Totec, we're not talking about the Totec about thousands of years ago. No, we're talking about the Totec of today and how we're getting inspired. And But, you know, this would not have happened without our ancestors like Don Carlos, Pramahansa, holding our intent to put the dream forward. So you see Castaneda as having been a doorway that the universe or the divine had brought into the picture in order to reintroduce something and also help Toltec evolve in a new way, bring it into the 21st century. Yes, absolutely. Because the moment that one feels something inside their core mm -hmm. and they follow that instinct, you know, when someone says it's my dream, it's not their dream. Right. Because it's our dream collectively. Right. Because when we, we, we leave our mind behind, but what stays here is how we contributed with life. And if it wasn't for all those ancestors, you know, especially right in this time of, of, of life, I have such a kick of the ancestors when we studied with mirror rooms mm -hmm. uh, in the Manic tradition, in the Nagua tradition, which is all based in Egypt tradition. Right. Because, and without all of those things of our ancestors did, there will be no telescope happening in space right now, seeing the creation of all this beautiful creation of life. Right. So every has their own step and their own time, and well, everything's perfect. Well, you brought up a, a few beautiful ideas that I really want to delve into a little bit later. You spoke of the consciousness, the continuity, the thread of evolution, the uh, inspiration of the dream and where it comes from, where consciousness originates. I want to cover all of those things. They're very deep topics, and, and I want to explore them. But I want to bring into the conversation quickly the fact that your family has been involved in this tradition for a very long time. You come from generations of folks who are involved in Toltec tradition. Is that correct? Yes, we can count, I think, five or six generations behind. And uh, me and my family, like a few years ago, we went to Jalisco, where our family is from. Mm -hmm. And we find out our eldest uh, teacher that we have online, I mean, uh, on record, is Don Ezequiel. He's my grandmother's grandfather, and he was an undertaker. He teached through fear. Mm -hmm. So we went through uh, to Jalisco, my brother Michael. Mm -hmm. He went inside the, the government office and found the 
birth certificate of great grandfather. And the interesting part is that great grandfather was the first Mexican of the family because he was between New Spain, which was the invasion of Spain to Mexico, right. and Mexico. So it was the beginning. So that's why we have record until the great grandfather. Right. But yes, he was an undertaker. And then his son was a military musician. So he one went through death to teach to live uh -huh. to music and discipline, which is the language of the infinite. And then her daughter was my grandmother, Sarita, mm -hmm. and she became a faith healer. Mm -hmm. And then it was my father who rebelled, but he was a medical doctor. And when he went to the medical doctor us with all this information, he took all the superstition and make it completely known that the mind had an illness and it was a parasite, a disease of the addiction of suffering. Mm -hmm. Words against themselves to stop everything. Mm -hmm. Even in the old tradition, people still were angry about the invasion that happened many years ago and the corruption and injustice. So all the dream was an inherent dream keeping back. So the oral tradition of the Totec was always underground, always hidden because of the Inquisition, because right. until until like in the 40s and 50s, everything began blossoming up. Mm -hmm. So every one of our family had different places where they come from. Like like I repeat, my grandfather was an undertaker and uh, a soldier military, my, his son, his grandmother, a faith healer, mm -hmm. and, uh, and father, a medical doctor. And then when, when I got into the picture, you know, I got into the substance abuse, into the dream of the addiction of the dream of the junkie. Mm -hmm. And I got out of that. So I got the mentality and the medicine to heal from this point of view. Mm -hmm. And it is the modern times. And this is something that is very important to keep traditions alive. We keep traditions alive, not with blind faith, repeating things that our grandparents did, because that's how we kill the tradition with blind faith. Right. So we keep the tradition alive, how the dream is right now and how the world is dreaming right now, mm -hmm. and how we are clearing up the smoke from right now, simply is like doing an autopsy on the illusion of today. Right. And with the eyes of the common sense from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. That's why the message of the Totec is no different than other traditions in the world, because it's an ancient common sense where, you know, where you know the truth, yes. but it's the truth not in words. It's an, and it's a truth that comes from direct experience, and I'll want to talk more about that as we go along. But I'm finding what you just said very interesting about how the tradition kept alive for all of these years. My first question around that is, is Toltec an oral tradition, or are there sacred writings that are passed down as well? It's both. It's oral tradition. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, let's say... One of my last books, or four last books ago, like the Wisdom of the Shamans, I got invited to this conversation. But the only word in the shaman tradition that I was accepting the conversation was like the Native American. Mm -hmm. None of them were shamans. Right. So they were confused. Why am I talking a lot about Christianity in my Wisdom of the Shaman books? Right. What does Christianity have to do with shamanism? Mm -hmm. And I have to do, it's a lot. Because let's say, I come from the tradition of the Toltec that mixed later with the Aztecs mm -hmm. and all these under. So Kulkulkan, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent is in all those traditions. Right. But then we got invaded. That means that the feathered serpent is going to go war against, you know, this new religion, this new dream. No, mm -hmm. it's going to incorporate that dream. Yes. Yes. So, I, we, so you were raised. We, in, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. So when we're at this point, we're here to purify every point of view that we see so we can see ourselves in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Yes. Life is an interesting mirror. You were raised, I'm going to guess, in the Catholic faith as well, weren't you? Well, yes. Uh, when you were born in Mexico, you have you have the, the indigenous and the Catholic, no matter what you do. Right. Even sacred churches in Mexico where the indigenous natives... They have taken over it mm -hmm. and they put their own deities mm -hmm. and you cannot take cameras there and everything is drawstring, yes. dry drawstring mm -hmm. that if one candle tips, the whole thing burns. So they're using old tradition with new tradition. That's what my grandmother did. Uh, shamanism, the tradition, 
is basically to do with the infinite. Mm -hmm. And the infinite is connected to everything. We're here in this point of life as witnessing a dream. Right. Because our ancestors, they come from the stars. So that's why we built all these pyramids, all these temples, because we're bringing the stars back to us. Right. And having this consciousness that we know exactly when we need to know what we need to know. We do not need to uh, memorize, to become parents, to memorize all humanity, because, you know, for us, it's not real. Right. It's Maya, like in the Buddhist tradition, the, the, the concept of everything being an illusion or a dream. One that is universal, one that is also personal. Yes? Yes. So let's talk about your particular desert walk. It's what I like to call them. Your struggle with addiction, you said. What was it in your life that brought you into that place and then brought you back to where you are right now? Well, from sitting right here, I can see clearly. But in the journey, I could not see clearly where it all began. Mm -hmm. But now that I see things clearly, it was because I made an intent with my grandmother one day. And one day I was probably like nine, ten years old. And we were in her own center, which she used to do um, healing mm -hmm. from curanderismo with, with candles, with herbs and a lot of prayers. And, you know, very, like I was saying earlier, Catholic and indigenous mix. Sure. So one day she asked me to put my hands in this person's shoulders mm -hmm. and to close my eyes. And I was like nine or ten. I was, I was very, so she said, just put all your love, put all your being, just don't think about anything and just send all this information that you have within into that person that needs it. And I began closing my eyes and I felt something within me, like coming through me and coming out of me. Mm -hmm. And then I remember putting my hands down and she's saying to me, and she said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And this is where it all began. Uh -huh. And I said, I want to be a healer just like you and my father. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, then she said, and where do you want to do this? I said, in Japan. Why Japan? Because I want to have, you know, the faith that I don't have to worry about a translator repeating what they know. Right. Because I'm correcting this person. I'm just speaking my heart. And they all laughed. And then 10 years later, I got to do that dream. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I was in Japan talking, you know, with a translator. But but this is the point where it all began. I see. Because I put an intent that I wanted to continue the family tradition the shamanic Nagual tradition. So in the Nagual tradition, you go to the underworld to become to this point. Yes. I think you touch hell. Right. And I love, especially I wanted to fit into this world where I felt like drama, victimization, that's how, what it means to be a grown-up, to have problems, to have heartbreaks, to have suffering. Right. And went and lose myself and substance was there waiting for me until things happen in life, you know, my physical body got hurt. My my body got full of poison. It was living hell. And then I felt the minimal opportunity to wake up. And that was the tunnel opening so I can get out. So after many years, like I said, almost more than a decade, I finally got out. But now I knew that I went through the underworld for a reason. Yes. I got to get medicine for myself. And when you get medicine for yourself, you can heal others. So now in this tradition, nothing's in vain. You get to put someone in your path who has gone through this difficult time. Right. It's what they call the dark night of the soul in the hero's journey. You hear a call, which obviously you heard as a very young child when you had that experience with your grandmother. Touching, you felt the love move through. You felt the connection to spirit. You felt the way that it moved through your body. And then... You've resisted the call. You began to go through the dark night of the soul, the purification process. I know in the Lakota Sioux tradition, shamanic tradition, once the shaman is recognized and retrieves a power animal, he is then buried and resurrected. That theme goes on and on in just about all of the mystical traditions. So you basically live that tradition as well, that, that story. Yes. And, and, and it happened a lot of a lot of resurrections begin happening. Right. And all of those resurrections were to running away to a new underworld, to a new underworld. It was underworld to underworld. Then one begins to see the realization everything's an underworld. Right. 
everything that we want to create is an underworld, but one day I see benefit in this, and not wanting to run away, but just seeing it in every day happening, even now. I said to my father like a few months ago, I said, Father, is it strange that I like to be judged? I know it's uncomfortable, but it's not because of that masochism. It's because every time I get to be judged or be put down, and I don't believe that, I create new metaphors, new stories, new medicine to not believe that. So I create new teachings to give to other people. And this is the opportunity when we go to the underworld, we identify that feeling. Yes. Because we're ready to listen to what mother has to talk to us. And no matter we're female or male, we're all living beings. Right. And this body belongs to Mother Earth. And we really belong, are the light that gives, you know, if we go, this light comes out of us, this body will become stiff little by little because, you know, our vessel, it is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah, exactly. And when you're speaking of this underworld as physical reality, you're talking about an underworld from a larger dream perspective, aren't you? Yes, from the dream of the planet, which is not the planet Earth dreaming, it's the dream of humanity. Mm -hmm. We create beautiful dreams for us, but we also create it hell. We do, and we contribute to it, don't we? Yeah. So what is your thought now about the way that the state of the world is and how the we are dreaming it personally and interacting with the larger consciousness or of the planet's dream? What is your thought about what's happening there? Well, the illusion will always be an illusion that fits over negative and positive like a battery so it can run. Mm -hmm. But the most that we get conscious in our own dream and begin being an authenticity state. Yes. And then someone say, what's an authenticity state? An authentic state is when you just surrender to life and you just let life be. You cannot change what's outside of you, mm -hmm. but you can enter within. So we're working from the inside. And it's not that we're working from the inside the planet. No, we're working from the inside within our physical body right. to deal with all the change of weather that's happening. Mm -hmm. And the change of weather is in state of mind that mm -hmm. creates this feeling that when we stand in our own, it's because we're ready to serve. Now, when we're strong in our own inner self, people in our families, our friends, our communities will see a strength as a reflection of strength so they can find their own strength because the body is meant to feel. We're not here to suppress it. And what we are afraid more of the body is when we feel fear. And fear is an energy that we forgot to respect because it's our body telling us to be at service. Now, if we're not a service to our physical body and create all these stories, then the illusion has taken us. But when we stand and we feel like there's something, like our faith is being tested, but really, what are we creating with our words? We are unlearning. So it comes a moment in our life, just like Paramahansa Jagananda did. The only way to wake up the giant that is sleeping is to go forward with loyalty all the way within ourselves. And is to enjoy the gift that was given to us. So we can remind everybody else about the gift. It's the stars that are on vacation. <laughs> the star dust that is on vacation. And look all around. This is beautiful. You know, and when I talk to people who don't want to believe in the power of humanity, they want to give all the credit for the aliens that they do not know what kind of alien life is out there. They're making the assumption that alien life is like human and they create buildings and they created the pyramids. And I said, do we suppress ourselves so much that we give credit to other artists that don't exist for the pyramid that were made by humanity, by putting attention. Now the telescope in the sky, did the aliens create that too? <laughs> right, right. So you're talking about the interaction and the acknowledgement of two different types of consciousness as I listen to you speak. You're talking about a personal consciousness, a personal dream, and an impersonal consciousness, a field of interaction that includes all of humanity, all, all life on Earth, and perhaps all life in the cosmos, because we're all made of the stuff of stars. We're talking about the ability to go within in order to retrieve and understand the dream that we are all experiencing individually, to wake up from that dream 
in a way that enables us to connect with the larger consciousness system. Am I putting those words correctly for you? Yes, absolutely. And then we have the ultimate respect for the ultimate dance of detachment, yes. which is dancing to the angel of death, with the angel of death, in the music of life, mm -hmm. in the dance floor of life. Then we know that everything, it is around us to create life. Now you're talking and, about the polar the polarization or the polarities of life. Yes. And as the angel of death and being able to walk with that. Yes. And from this point on, we live with gratitude, not with the fear to hold on and miss everything that's around us. So let's talk about how we get there individually and collectively. You went through your uh, dark night of the soul. You also were instructed in, we'll call it the pure land or the clear mind through your family's lineage and tradition. You resonated with it. You left it. You came full circle and returned. Very much a hero's journey. Well done. Glad to know that. With that information that, and experience that you have had and has been imparted in a very practical way by your family, through your father's books and through your books, through your brother's books. We're talking about methods of doing that in what I'll call a practice of life, not the exploration of consciousness, but a practice of life. Let's start there. The four agreements, for those who know nothing about it, your father obviously became very popular here with those. I know you've written a book called The Fifth Agreement. Let's start with the four agreements. What are those, and how are they practical for life? How do they help people explore? Well, the first one is to be impeccable with the word. And to know the word is the ticket to write for exploration. Because if it's, say, any word, like, say, Paris, the caves, the mountains, we already put a target of where we're going to go out there and explore, so we have an intent. Mm -hmm. So now with the word creates dreams. So now we have to be impeccable with it, to be impeccable with ourselves. What dream are we making with ourselves? Right. And be responsible for that, knowing that we are the creators of our own, you know, my, thinking mind. So when we are impeccable with the word, we begin to be impeccable with the life that we're creating and the belief that we're creating all the time. And there's many people who are not impeccable with the word, like I used to be all the time. Right. Like, I'm not perfect, I'm not meant for love, I cannot change. Right there, I'm using the word like a spell to put on myself to break my own spirit. Right. So one day I feel like if I break my own spirit with the word, can I lift my own spirit with the word? And this is when I knew that the word is here to serve me, not for me to be a slave and service to the word. Then the word becomes my creativity. What do I think about myself? Mm -hmm. Do I really think that I'm not meant for love? Right. And many people live that way. Right. So let's stay with that before we move to the next agreement, because of very profound statements you made there. In many traditions, mystical traditions, the idea of expressing intent through the word is a very powerful thing. Even in the Abrahamic faiths, God spoke the universe into creation said, let there be light in Christianity and Judaism. So the implication there is that the word is very much a statement of intention about creation of something. It is also a reflection of this thing called personal consciousness, what is already inside of you. When we think about words, we think about means of communicating, as I'm doing to you. I'm communicating my thoughts, my feelings, my questions, my hungers, my curiosity, my desire. All of that is expressed in words in the form of questions as I ask you, right? It is also, on a higher level of the dream, a reflection, if you can connect with the higher level, a reflection of the eternal knowledge, of the eternal wisdom. It's really a matter of where you're focusing consciousness. Is that a correct assessment of what you just said? Absolutely correct, because the earth becomes our witness to our word. Yes. And 
when we know the spirit is our witness, the spirit is another reflection of our higher self that we cannot fool ourselves so we can leave a dream behind yes. and a new dream can be ahead. And who are we going to take to this new dream? Divine Mother. Mm-hmm. And who has been living in that nightmare? Mm-hmm. Divine Mother. Right. So the mother begins witnessing, okay, I'm ready to change my dream. Mm-hmm. I see what I couldn't see before. And that word now comes with consciousness. Right. So in that respect, we are indeed a portion of the consciousness of the entire planet, changing the vibration of the planet in the way that we express ourselves. If we do it in truth, if we do it through connection, if we do it through love, we change things. Yes, absolutely. And this is the beginning of living the last judgment, which many people make all this superstition and pure like it's the world going to end the world's going to end no it just means that it's going to be the last time that we judge ourselves Mm -hmm. with the word so that is a very good reason to be impeccable with your word yes a very good reason to be truthful as well to speak from the heart and that is a very good place for us to take a quick break and allow a moment for reflection. We'll be back with Don Jose in just a moment. Expanding on Consciousness is brought to you by the Monroe Institute, a nonprofit organization and leader in consciousness education and research, teaching you how to actively explore and use expanded states of consciousness, providing direct experiences that are deeply personal uniquely meaningful, and life-changing. Monroe has been helping people create more meaningful and joyful lives through the guided exploration of expanded consciousness for 50 years. Gain the knowledge and understanding you seek to create the life you desire. Learn more about where to start your journey to expanded awareness with Monroe. Visit MonroeInstitute.org or check out our Expand Meditation app available on the App Store or Google Play. What is the second agreement? The second one, it is my favorite one that one has given many gifts, is do not take things personal. Mm-hmm. And this thing it is, do not take myself personal. Mm-hmm. You know, nothing that people do outside has to do with us. They're living their own individual dream. Mm -hmm. They're owning their own individual pain and suffering. Like I remember when I was with my father, this was one of the biggest lessons that I felt with this agreement. He was having a heart attack. And I didn't know back then that he could have died or that he went to a nine week of coma. Mm -hmm. Before I spoke to him, he said to me, you know, be aware when people speak, they're speaking in pain. And someone's going to approach you speaking in pain. Don't believe them. Mm-hmm. They're just like, don't take them personal. Mm-hmm. They're just don't know what to do with their pain. And uh, of course, my father went to a language coma and someone came to me and said, Jose, this is your fault that this happened to your father. Mm-hmm. The old Jose would have used that to hurt himself with. Mm-hmm. But the, the one who was seeing things with the direction of my father and my teacher, saying someone's going to approach me and saying this, you know, right. don't take them personal. And this is something that has helped me in my whole life. When someone screams at me, when someone puts me down, uh, do not take them personal because they're asking for help. And that's something that helps me when I said earlier that I like to be judged because I know that it's not personal, that that person is just in asking for help. It's in pain. And when a puppy has like a blister in their paw or something's hurting, you touch it, they're going to throw a bite, not because they're, they, they're angry, you know, they're just in pain. Right. And it's going to bite you because it's in pain. The moment that we begin seeing humanity, like this is because we were in pain too. Yes. And in unveiling the way that we suppress ourselves down, it was the ultimate programming for us humans to live in a suffering world, to be, you know, reward and punishment, and to be domesticated in that way, to really see ourselves. Where do we lose our power? Where do I take myself personal? What I give to the illusion? And when I feel that, it's like Buddha saying to Mara, architect, you will not rebuild your home here anymore. Right. And it's like, we're not 
we build our own suffering from the past. It's like, why should we go in a relationship with somebody that was like our first relationship that was full of abuse and full of drama? It's because we have changed. Right. Now, point of life, like an elder point of view, they don't want to be in a relationship full of drama or disrespect because they have grown in life that they respect themselves so much. And the moment that we see how we, we unbreak the spell of taking things personally by the word, we cleanse the word mm -hmm. and we see true heart now. And that's one of the difficult things in life to see because I remember in my, in my culture, in Tijuana, in my neighborhood, it's like we were asking, we were like almost ready to take something personal, like somebody's rocking on the street and go, what are you looking at? Right, right, you know, right. I'm looking at anything, you know. <laughs> But your attitude is very, and you reference the Buddha, is very much like Buddhism. The idea behind that, if I can encapsulate for the audience, is that we're not really detaching from the, um, the fact that the occurrence happened. We're not in a form of denial. We're using that method of understanding through clearer consciousness to understand that what had just occurred what are you looking at type of thing, was more coming from a place of pain on the other individual. That invokes a sense of compassion within us because we understand our own pain, right? We understand what the origins of pain are, maya, the illusion. And that in doing so, you are reclaiming your personal power in order to not feed into this never-ending cycle of the blood and the tears. You are, in a sense, becoming a bodhisattva in the Buddhist tradition. You are awakening to something, and you're bringing that awakening through your word into the world. Did that encapsulate what you just said very clearly? Yes, absolutely, and that becomes the art. Yes. Of living right there. Mm -hmm. Going to how we're going to handle all of these things, and we create art with it. Yes. You're literally repainting the landscape of the entire world. Yes. And that gives a very unique meaning to what Nizar Gadada once said when he said that you are the subtle underlying cause of the entire universe. What the Kabbalists speak of in terms of tikkun alam, healing the world and raising the sparks. You're literally making all of life a work of art. Yes. And... You, and, and, and that's the service right there. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about living this way is that, you know, I used to hang with a talented guitar player, but it always judged itself that he could never play in public because it always saw higher, who was higher than him, right. who was higher. And then one day we went to this club and he heard other people play and he right away beginning judging them. Mm -hmm. But he goes, no, wait, Jose, I'm judging myself. Mm -hmm. And then he went on stage and played. And one day he said, you know, I've been judging myself that I couldn't play because I was more comfortable in that situation. Right. But the moment that you allow yourself to not compare yourself with anybody else, the moment that you realize that you are just perfect the way you are, right. that you are the love of your life, that, you know, that where are you going to go? from this point on to create right and that doesn't mean you cannot improve your craft you improve your art form you improve your way of being in the world but self-judgment from a super ego construct meaning the internal judge is never helpful it keeps you cycling in the same personal nightmare and reflection of self yes because like like you like love what you said because many people in the total tradition when i grew up if they didn't have the, the self-respect and love to see themselves in the mirror, right. the Totec tradition would still be like if it was 50 years ago, right. full of superstition, because people don't want to heal. People want to get comfortable and when they're used to in a band-aid. And that just not sit well with someone who wants to, you know, open, live with an open heart. Yeah, I want to talk about the tradition and some of the quote-unquote myths and superstitions as they apply, because... I think that what you're bringing into the conversation now applies to 
the psycho-spiritual understanding of consciousness and healing in general. But I think that the tradition itself, at least from the research that I've done, also speaks to that, but in a very different way, in the language of our elders. But we'll get back to that. What's the third agreement? Do not make assumptions. And this is a very powerful one because sometimes we make assumptions of our fears and we make what we fear in life to hurt ourselves a reality Mm -hmm. because we don't ask questions and we just assume people are like this or like that. Even when people change, we make the assumption that people will never change. But the moment that you give them benefit doubt and you're not afraid to communicate what you feel inside, Mm -hmm. then you're not making any assumptions. And uh, this is something that, that is very you know, important in life, to not give our power away, to not give our power away for things that are not even real. And one day I I was speaking in Detroit with this little kid, probably in the sixth grade. And they asked him about the the four agreements and said, what is your favorite agreement? I was surprised that kids were like listening to this, you know, kids who have been through a lot, you know, seeing things in the the neighborhoods, in their community a lot. So they grew up faster, but with an innocent mind still, and the little kid said, well, my favorite agreement is to not make assumptions because I like to, I want to play with all my friends in school, but sometimes they make an assumption about me that is not true. Mm-hmm. And I want them to say that you're here. Please ask me because that's not true. And I want to play with you. And I saw this healing happening in front of my eyes. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that don't make assumption is a very powerful one. How we create the knowledge, the words and create these nightmares. And, and then if you even do a chemical uh like a like a chemical lab and now get this words that's coming out of us of the assumption making it now going with someone else's chemical lab let's say a neighbor now we're gossiping with another person right. and the assumptions getting bigger and bigger and bigger you know i can see a lot of distortion happen it's true and you can't be impeccable with your word if in fact you make assumptions right Yes. <laughs> and, and you can't be even impeccable with your concept of attachment if you make assumptions. So there, yes. one builds on the other, the agreements. And I'm also hearing, and you didn't say this, but I'll make an assumption if I may. The assumption is that it, we're not just talking about assuming with people. We are talking about an assumption about the process of life and situations too was that a correct assumption exactly yeah and if you don't let your heart turn to stone you could take that stone and use it as a foundation to stand up and create something new back to being the artist what's the fourth agreement this fourth agreement i love to say this because it's my father's favorite agreement because he always says it out (laughs) (laughs) always do your best because without doing your best none of the agreements will work because it's not trying, it's doing. And when you begin wanting a change in your life, once you're doing your best, the ball is rolling. So things are going to change no matter what. Relationships are going to end or are gonna get stronger, no, no matter what. But it's returning more to your authentic state where you can wake up with excitement instead of what's the point. Right. And many people live with what's the point because they're not making the best in their life. And that's where I talked earlier that it's all about service. And the little image that I love that I take away from the Catholic tradition in Mexico, and I return her to what it was in the ancestors do not seen, which is the Virgin of Guadalupe. And the Virgin of Guadalupe is this mother, like Divine Mother Mary, mm-hmm. with a little angel underneath her. Well, the little angel represents the human mind the mind that's dreaming, holding up life, the physical body that it represents the mother, Guadalupe, which is our physical body, no matter we're male or female, we're respecting and holding life in a plate. Now the angel has to give to hurt or to support life. And before we didn't know what we were doing until we wake up consciously, that with our mind, we hurt our body, we hurt the planet. And I see many dream of feminization, you know, femininity, power, you know, talking about freeing divine mother. I see many cultures, religions talking about, I love mother, but they treat their females with disrespect. Mm-hmm. 
And that contradicts everything that they're standing up for. So I say to myself, how am I going to respect this, that I see it clearly in me, because it's not in anybody else, it's in me because I feel this. So now I have to be loyal to the love of my life, right. which is the physical earth incarnated with my thinking mind. Now I see everybody else dreaming mm -hmm. and everybody has their own garden or earth to take care of mm -hmm. and doing our best. You know, we can make it in any kind of weather. Like the other day, it was snowing up here in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. I had to do something outside. Well, the weather wasn't going to stop me. Even though I had like 10 minutes of work outside, it had to be done. Right. But the lazy mind could be, no, maybe later, maybe later, but then it will be more work to do. Yeah. So whatever in the moment, that's when we do our best. As the Buddhists say, we could chop wood and carry water with a different sense of awareness this time, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's just about changing our internal reactions and our internal way of being. So we're talking about functions of consciousness again. I want to ask you, because you've written the book called The Fifth Agreement. What is The Fifth Agreement? The Fifth Agreement is to be skeptical but to learn to listen. Mm -hmm. And must be skeptical in a social position that I'd say I'm more intelligent than the outside or I don't want to listen to the outside. It has nothing to do with that. Many people right away go for that, but what it has to do to be skeptical is being about my own poisonous thoughts, yes. being skeptical of my negative programming. And then when I'm skeptical about it, something happens, I begin doing a practice of unlearning mm -hmm. and that unlearning is because i'm listening with my heart what word resonates this word doesn't resonate this word i don't give power to this word i give power to i'm choosing now the power of my belief inside of myself and that is to get all the energy that i take from the words that make me suffer that I used to make myself suffer. I changed that. Now from that point of view, I'm becoming immune to my own poison. And it's all because I made an agreement with myself that said, Jose, protect me from myself. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I begin to unlearn all of that. And you know, I never dreamt about making books mm -hmm. or even teaching with my family. I just wanted to live a nightmare behind because my mind was dreaming a nightmare. So I begin my path. I begin to unlearn. I begin to share, especially when my father got heart attack. He was in coma. That's when I really stepped into it in 2001. And then all of a sudden I was opening and I wasn't teaching. I was sharing and everybody was a mirror that they helped me. They didn't maybe do not understand this, but they were giving me their life, their actions, everything, their presence as a reflection of myself that I begin on learning. So angel training, it means training the messenger. And the fifth agreement is all about training the messenger that we are. So I begin showing up, showing up, showing up, and I begin to unlearn. And all of a sudden, my father was there on, on, on a Saturday. My grandma was there on a Sunday. We were three generations. I never dreamt about doing this. And then the publisher came in and says, this is the FIFA agreement. And that was the beginning of that, seven years of, of that work. But all of that is because it was the graduation of the Toltec. It's when the apprentice becomes the teacher, its own guide. Mm -hmm. And now it's consciously of what it's creating. Right. And this is when the FIFA agreement really begin to be skeptical of our own poison. So we can not be the scorpion that stung itself with its own tail again and again. And one day in a conference, someone said to my brother, scorpions do that, don't do that. They don't sting and sell there with their own tail. They go, exactly, why do we do it? Right. We are interesting. <laughs> we are interesting in our polarization. So let's talk about angel training and the way that we collapse that duality, the way that we employ the five agreements, because I think what you just said is very important and and i heard you talk about 
developing an observer of the self through what is presented in our thoughts and feelings. Many people have no idea that they're having thoughts and feelings. They identify with them. They're natural. And they never pause to really take a look at what that is. They never pause to change their story through discerning, let alone, you know, observing, but then discerning. So it's observation first, then discernment. Is that correct? Yes, because you put attention, you feel all around. Right. Like the, the ultimate challenge of the Totec is how are we going to describe what we feel in two words? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and many times without awareness, we describe everything we feel in two words and we believe ourselves. We don't know that there's a, a gatekeeper in our habitat mm-hmm. because we believe the domesticating, you know, the domestication that's coming from outside of us, we're good kids or bad kids. Right. We're a good a spouse or a bad spouse. We're a good worker or a bad worker. And all of this, we don't really see how the world is creating our dream. But then we can wake up to see, hey, we're the dreamers who give meaning to the world to create our dream. That's why I love this opportunity in life that I got born, that we get born in this generation where we can feed over other cultures. Because like we're saying earlier, the Buddha, Jesus, Swami, Paramahansa, and and, uh, Quetzalcoatl, all of these different beings, they had something that we all have in these times, and it's a dreaming mind. Right, and and a dreaming mind would reflect everything that it sees, and that's what the beautiful thing about stepping back and looking how we dreaming as a humanity. How you know the other day I, I was playing with my with my grandchild, and we were playing Transformers. You know the the robots. Yeah, and I'm from the couch to the floor, and there was this little uh, hot wheel, little car, and he his hand touched the hot wheel and he's hurt the hand, he would begin to cry. And he said, let's pause the game. Let's pause the game. Right. And the moment, it made me realize how many times in humanity we're playing the game. In hospitals, where loved ones, we have debates five years, but they're in the hospital, they're pausing the game. You know, and really to see now how humanity are playing this game that they're not even being aware they can pause it at any time and change it. They're really believing it. Like we used to believe, or like I used to believe my dream when I was a kid. Like, you know, something happens in the school is my fault. Something happens is my fault. And, and making the martyr things, you know. And from this point on, how can we ever make peace this way? We can't. And I'm really glad that you brought Quetzalcoatl into the conversation. Because that image, that deity, looms large in Toltec. A lot of people are not familiar with it. That deity is the Toltec answer to the same mediating principle of above and below. Tell the audience who doesn't really know the story of Quetzalcoatl what it is and what it means to the Toltec tradition. Well, the Quetzalcoatl is the Christ energy of the Toltec, the Aztecs, the indigenous, because it represents something. The little snake that did the impossible, that he got wings to fly. Mm -hmm. So we can totally see ourselves, how many times we were that little snake that was afraid to come out of darkness, Mm -hmm. our own world so we can fly with it. And not be like Icarus, trying to get some other people's wings and feathers to fly and touch the sun because it burns. They never touch the sun because they were using somebody else's wings. Mm -hmm. The feathered serpent earned its wings. Mm He went through the underworld, came out of darkness, Mm -hmm. and flew itself to touch the sun, only to return to give the message from the sun, which is the message of life. Mm -hmm. So when we came out of our poisonous thing, and that's what the humanity has, similar than the snake, has poison, but it has not poison as venom or liquid, it has poison as words, as energy. Because the human, like it's a quote, is a container of energy. Our job in life really is to contain our energy and with that energy conduct. And the dream that we're weaving is the dream of our life. Like the feathered serpent did the impossible, 
Jesus in his lifetime did the impossible. Siddhartha in his life did the impossible. Everything that they said uh, Quetzalcoatl represents is to do the impossible. So let's say you're looking into the mirror and you have the mentality of, of victim, I can never change. But then you look into the mirror, you see your higher self, you feel your higher self. There's like this energy that takes over your voice and says, no, I'm going to do it. I'm done playing games. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this and I know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. Now I want to do it for myself. In that moment, a feather pops up, mm -hmm. another feather pops up. Mm -hmm. And the more feathers that pop up is the more awareness that you know what to do in your own life without being told what to do with your own life. Now, when you're doing what you want to do with your own life, you have power, you have self-faith. Mm -hmm. And you didn't know nobody's validation or permission. And you will be tested over and over and over again. And every time you succeed, another feather pops out. Yes. And when <laughs> your feathers pop out, all of humanity gets raised. The entire planet gets raised. And therein lies the interconnectedness, from my perspective, of every mystical tradition that has ever been revealed or created by humanity. Yes. <laughs> and that's when we really wake up to understand we all work for the same boss. We go to the Easter, we go to the West, we go to the North, the South, we find all these traditions and families. We all work for the same boss. That's right. And we all have this mystical idea and connection to that pyramidal shape, don't we? Yes. What is and it the, about that shape? The, the, the beautiful part about that shape, the pyramid, is the moment that we get meditating, the moment that we put attention to something, our, our eyes begin playing, yeah. our image begins playing, and it's the cultivation of a dream, being put up another dream, being put up another dream. So this is when I like to talk to my, my, my friends about uh, spirit travel. Because it's about the artist inspiring itself to all the places that he has touched. That let's say we have climbed the pyramid, or we are walking in the neighborhood where we grew up. We close our eyes. We begin walking. We begin seeing the images. And then just remembering one image, the other images apply. So that is the invocation of our intent, bringing back the dream. And this is something that I love to say to many of my friends as well when I'm talking about this, is that when we dream about things that are not happening yet, they call this deja vu. Mm -hmm. And we find this familiar. And, and I see the reason it's familiar, I say to my friends, is because we already lived it. We already went through it. We're just every time we get the, the habit of turning the sun around again, we begin doing things differently. That's why we meet people and we say, we know them. You look familiar because we do know them. And this is the interesting thing about this space that we live as living beings right now. There's time, there's patience, there's all these things creating itself that is, is just beautiful. Like the, I heard a Tibetan master, she said, when they asked her what was her favorite ingredient to make meals, and she said time because it marinates everything. Mm -hmm. So we're feeling the marination of our whole being. And sometimes I love when I deal with intent because if I'm stubborn and I want something, the universe won't give it to me. And when I'm forgotten about it, I continue on, the universe just throws it out. Like if it was a little flyer that I'm not interested to go anymore. But I, but I remember seeing, you know, at expectations. <laughs> and that, my friend, is a knowledge of power. And to explain that, would be a long conversation, and I'm very aware of the amount of time that you spent with me today. I want to be respectful of your time. Oh. I cannot tell you how much it's been a pleasure for me to talk to you. I look forward to speaking to Miguel, and um, you are a light. I know light oh. when I see it. You are a light. It's been a real pleasure to get to know you. It's same way, brother, and thank you for this opportunity to get to share in Colive, and, and I uh, I, I welcome the, and look forward to the next time we get to talk more because we just went so quick. I hear you. I felt exactly the same way. If people want to get in touch with you and your family, how can they do that? How can they find places where they yes, can read you? We books? have an, uh, a family website called miguelriz.com, and that allows 
what my father and my brother and I are doing in, in, in communities. And I, I have one, only one social media page is in Instagram. And in there, I like to just throw little ideas. And, uh, and when I have something to share, I, I like to share videos or stuff like that. And that's, that's my, 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 my playground. <laughs> I understand. I understand. So what's the address of the family website then? Uh, MiguelReese.com, my father's name, but without the Don. Terrific. Don Jose, it's been a real pleasure. I look forward to our next conversation. And in the meantime, go about your light work. Yes, thank you, Don Marcos. And thank you so much. I very appreciate the time. Now, the pleasure has been mine. Be certain to tune in again to Expanding on Consciousness to become informed on the fascinating field of consciousness studies and its applications. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the guests and the host. They do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Monroe Institute. Expanding on Consciousness is underwritten and produced by the Monroe Institute, copyright 2023, and is broadcast by permission. Reproduction or redistribution without the express written consent of Monroe Institute is prohibited by law. For more information about Expanding on Consciousness, visit our website at monroeinstitute.org or connect with us on the socials. Thank you for listening.